So did y'all make a new friend? All that hand-holding and stuff, y'all getting all lovey-dovey? <laughs> we're so glad you're with us as we kick off our life. Well, we're not kicking it off. This is the second week, isn't it? We kicked it off last week, and we're so glad you're with us as this message series continues. If this is your first week with us, we want you to know that we as a church really care about all areas of your life, and we want to help you to live a better life. And in order to do that, we've got to be honest with ourselves and admit that finances have dragged us down a time or two. Would anybody agree with that? Anybody ever had a little financial, yeah, a little bit of it? Now, if you're a young person, where are my young people? I see you scattered about. Sit up straight. Pay attention, because when you grow up, you won't be as dumb as some of us adults are right now, okay? You won't have made some of the mistakes that we've made. You could live your life differently. Um, I heard several people last week talking about, man, if I'd known some of those things. Did you hear that statistic he threw out that when you were 20 years old, if you'd put $100 a month in the bank, by the time you get ready to retire, you'd have $1.65 million? How many of us wish we could have had $100 at that point to put it in? Craziness, isn't it? But we do. We care about this. This is a this is an issue in our lives. It's a spiritual issue when it comes to God. So we really, really care about that as well. In fact, Michael and I, after watching it, after every service on Sundays, what we do is we call each other. You know, right? We, we get in our cars. We call each other. So how is Harvest? How is Madison? How's everybody? How's this? You know, check on y'all so we know what to pray for for the week and we can remind ourselves of things. And he called me, and first words out of both of our mouths is. Man, we got to start taking this Ramsey stuff really seriously. I mean, we're doing the same thing. We're going, we've got to, you know, we got to, we got to do this. So, just so you know, so you hold us accountable, we sat down Thursday night and we developed our 2014 budget. So, we've got a budget, we've got a plan, and we're going to try to follow the Ramsey. How many of y'all, how many of y'all had some financial discussions this week? Anybody have financial discussions? Oh, yeah, several of you. Good, good, good. Something we can always grow in. Now, I have to tell you this as we get ready to show it. Now, I know a lot of people don't like video preachers. Anybody in here hate video preachers? Anybody? Yeah, 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 some of y'all. Well, let me tell you this. Within five minutes, you'll forget. It won't even matter. And I appreciate those of you that are patient with this that don't like it and those of you that embrace it, yay for you. But um, we could never afford to have Dave Ramsey come here as a guest speaker. Just so you know, he's debt-free for a reason, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know. We can never afford to have him come here. But what he did do is he went to a large church, and he spoke for three Sundays, and he allowed it to be taped. And then he offered it as a gift to smaller ch- churches, which I think says a lot about Dave Ramsey being able to do that for us. So we're able to get his wisdom. There's nobody better to talk to us about this than Dave Ramsey. And so we're excited about this. And we know that the kids in the room are listening Because one of the families, as I said, we had so many families this week whose pipes burst. And one of the families, when their pipes burst, burst, their their teenager looked at them and they said, well, mom and dad, weren't you listening to Ramsey? And they like kind of, you know, did like this. He said, yeah, Ramsey said you'll have a major financial event every 10 years. So, yeah, our kids are listening. So let's turn our attention to Dave Ramsey as he shares some wisdom and helps us live our life. Thank you, thank you. Wow. I tell you what, you know, I go around the world teaching all over the place, teaching people all about this idea of debt. And the idea that if you could get out of debt, you'd have some money. If you didn't have any payments, you'd have some money. And, and, and people look at me with two different problems with that. One is they get all sophisticated and academic. They start talking about, well, Dave, there's, there's good debt. There, there's good debt. And, and Wall Street has proven that recently. Dave, debt is a tool to be used for your good. And, you know, I used to believe that garbage, too. I was in college, and they used to teach us this stuff about leverage and internal rates of return and net present values. And I'm not against education. I mean, my financial education is part of where I am now. Academia is a good thing. But you can't believe everything you hear to the extent it doesn't line up with this. Because, you know, I got to thinking the borrower is truly slave to the lender. That's not a, We're not kidding about that. God's truth says that every single time. And I got to thinking about it, and I'm thinking, who was it taught me that borrowing money was good? This was my finance professor in college who was broke. A broke finance professor is like a shop teacher with missing fingers. You see, if you want to win, you ought to try finding some people that are winning and emulate or mimic what they are doing. If you hire a personal trainer and you walk in the first morning and your personal trainer is 400 pounds, we got a problem. If you've written a book on marriage and you've been married 14 times, bless your heart, I hope this one sticks, but I don't want to read your book. 
I was with a couple the other day that were 87 years old. Been married 60 some odd years. If you want to be married, that's who you ask. You ask him, how you married her 60 something years? She don't kill you. <laughs> Men want to know these things. Find a winner and emulate what they're doing. If you study, Forbes magazine has the 400 wealthiest people in North America that it publishes every year. 67% of them, 7 out of 10 of them are first generation rich. They started with nothing, became wealthy. When they surveyed the wealthiest people in North America, not your broke brother-in-law with an opinion, but the 400 wealthiest people in North America, and they asked them what the most important key to becoming wealthy was, 75% of them said getting out of debt and staying out of debt. Hmm. But broke people always got a plan for a payment, don't they? Because broke people always want a car that they can't afford. They always want a stereo that they can't afford. They always want some clothing or a vacation that they can't afford. And let me tell you how you can tell if you can afford it. You have the money to pay for it. Unless you have the money, that by definition means you can't afford it. Because when you go into debt, then you're hooked to those payments. Now you're a slave. Jesus said it's tough to serve two masters. So what are we going to do about this? How are we going to get out? And we want to talk about breaking the bondage of debt and how you really do it in a real practical, hands-on, real-world application. See, the truth is that if you spread a lie or a myth often enough, loud enough, and with enough sophistication, eventually people will begin to believe it. And they will, they will tell other people about the lie. And it's not that they meant to lie. They just believe the lie and they spread it. It happens all the time. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Everybody stand up for a second. Now here's what I want you to do. I need you to close your eyes. I can see all of you and I will mess with you if you don't follow my instructions. I need you to close your eyes and with your eyes closed, I want you to play my games. I promise not to mess with you so long as you play. If you're wrong, I won't make fun of you. If you don't play, I will totally pick on you. And we'll point the camera right at you. Here's what I want you to do. With your eyes closed, I want you to take your best guess with your eyes closed and point north. No, sir, up does not count. <laughs> if you're wrong, it's okay, but give us your best guess. This is funny. Open your eyes and look around. Uh-oh. Somebody's wrong. Well, apparently some of you aren't lost because according to my compass, north is this way. <laughs> now we have people pointing this way and this way, and a couple are pointing this way. Now, we're taping this in Oklahoma, and so if you want to go to Canada, north is going to be this way. You can get to Canada this way, but it's the long way around. <laughs> you can argue about this, but you'll be wrong. You can start your own denomination, but you'll be wrong. This is north. Now, I didn't know either. I've got a compass. I cheated. But you know what? You and I have got a compass. And it's not cheating to not be lost. Everybody have a seat. See, what has happened with this is debt has been marketed to us so aggressively, so thoroughly, with such sophistication and such manipulation for so long that Americans and people all around the world have begun to believe all deep down within their heart that they will never financially be somebody unless they use debt to do it. Debt is the path to prosperity. If you want your good car, son, you've got to build your credit. You'll never be anybody unless you build your credit. We, in, in America, we worship at the altar of the FICO score. Oh, great FICO, our provider. FICO, thank you, FICO. How'd you get that? Oh, Mr. FICO sent me. It was because of my FICO. I worked really hard to keep my FICO up. And your FICO is a, is a mathematical algorithm that, that shows how you interact with debt. When you quit borrowing money, your FICO score will erode. How am I going to live? We worship at the altar of debt. We think debt is our provider. Now, I don't want to get all religious or crazy on you, but, you know, it turns out God's your provider. I know that sounds kind of bizarre sometimes when you say it. It sounds like, you know, some kind of preacher guy. But he really is your provider. He really is where it comes from. And sometimes he provides you with two hands and a brain to work. Those who don't work don't eat. I read that. The diligent prosper, not the lazy at home watching TV. That, you know, that, it's in there. I mean, he, he chose you. I mean, it's not like he's just going to roast the duck and throw it in your back window. You've got to go kill it and cook it, you know. But, but God is your provider. 
that's how this stuff works. And debt has been marketed to us so thoroughly that we now believe it's our provider. And to imagine living without debt requires a complete paradigm shift, a completely new way of looking at things. Let's play with some new ways of looking at things. If you get a new way of looking at things, you know what's happened? Learning occurs. That's how you get a new way of looking at things. That's why when you read Scripture and then five years later you read the same Scripture and you go, whoa, I never thought about it that way. Why? Because you have a new way of looking at things. You had new eyes to see the exact same words and truth. They leap off the page, grab you around the neck, and you go, oh, okay, I got it now. It gives you a different feel, doesn't it? And you could just kind of blow past it other times, and then other times you go, wow. And it's in there. So that's a new way of looking at things. That's, that, that is learning. And that's what we're doing in here. We're learning today. God's ways of handling money. God's ways of getting out of debt. And so here's one. Let's look at this one. How many of you see the white candlestick or the vase in the middle? Look, it's right there in the middle. Raise your hand when you see it. I'll wait till everyone sees it and raises your hand. It's white. It's in the middle. Raise your hand when you see it. I'll wait. It's there. Okay, good. Now, how many of you see two faces looking at each other? Good. How many of you see two people getting ready to kiss? Set the scene. Okay, now. Here's another one. Men, I'll warn you about this one. I've been married 27 years, and you better watch your punctuation. A woman without her man is nothing. A woman without her man is nothing. A woman without her man is nothing. It's all in the way you look at it. You better look at it right if you're a smart boy. Okay, that's, you know, it, it, you get a new way of looking at things because now you've been taught punctuation matters. Here's another one. You've got to look at this one really carefully. If you look at it carefully, you'll see it. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. My wife Sharon and I, we got out of school. We got married. No, this is not marriage. We had a little bit of student loan debt and a lot of money on our Amoco card because I bought a couch on my Amoco card. I don't think you're supposed to do that, but the guy at the fleet market said it was okay. Um, and we started off our lives and we were eating off a card table, driving a 1902 Pinto, and, and we were trying to get going and, and we needed a television. We needed a television. So I went down to the electronics store and I got 90 days same as cash because I had no cash. And I was a finance major and so I'm going to get this free money, zero interest because I'm so smart. By the way, 80% of 90 days same as cash doesn't pay off in 90 days and transfers to high interest loans at your local finance company, 24 to 38% with a prepayment penalty just to go ahead and hit you one more time to remind you how dumb you are. Most people don't pay it off in 90 days. And if you don't pay it off in 90 days, by the way, the 90 days isn't free either. They backcharge you through that free interest. It's how it works. It's a game. It's called fishing. Right? That's the deal. And so we started off our lives that way, and we went and bought a television. Then I went and bought a car I wanted that my wife, I thought, needed. Yeah, some of you guys have bought a car that you wanted that you thought your wife needed. Yeah, you blamed it on her, in other words, right? And, and then we went to get a house. Get a house, get a house, get a house, get a house. you got to get a house if you don't get a house. Oh, you don't want to be a renter. Renters are evil. <laughs> renters' salvation is in jeopardy. You do not want to be a renter because this is the way our culture talks, isn't it? You'll never be anybody. Get a house, get a house, get a, get a house, get a house. You know what happens when broke people get a house? They get broken. That's why they call them real estate brokers. <laughs> a house is not a blessing when you're broke. It'll take you apart and take you down. So if you want to get a house, do some stuff about money that the Bible says so you're not broke anymore, and then go get you a house. But I didn't do that. I've been married about 15 minutes. People are in my living room going, you need to get a house. Get a house, get a house, get a house, get a house. And so we went and found a house with nothing down because that's how much we had to put down. They called it creative financing, which if you look it up in the Greek means too broke to buy a house. So we bought a house about three blocks over from where I grew up. Larry Burkett used to say we spend the first five to seven years of our marriage trying to attain the same standard of living as our parents. Only it took them 35 years to get there. I lived in the same neighborhood as mom and dad, had a better car than mom and dad, and for sure had a better TV and stereo system than mom and dad. 
52% of the marriages end in divorce in North America today. Of those that divorce, the number one cause is money fights and money problems. Of those that divorce in the first seven years of marriage, 90% say money buys it. Young marriages are falling apart everywhere. You know why? When you're like this, your legs get stuck. <laughs> they come in our office, they look like this all the time for financial counseling. Dave, can you get me out? <laughs> when I went broke and started over, I discovered this was the truth. That the borrower slave to the lender is the truth. Regardless of how you feel, this is the truth. And so regardless of what somebody, one of the benefits of going broke is I didn't care what anybody thought anymore. You get over worry about what people think. And you just go do whatever. And if they laugh at you, you just go, well, that's good. Just keep laughing. And you just keep going. And so I just kept going. And people made fun of me. Dave, you're not, you're a simpleton. You're not very sophisticated. The financial world thinks I'm a wiener in a steakhouse, you know. <laughs> and my net worth six times what any one of theirs is. You know, I mean, isn't it amazing? Concept. But we got out of these things. And I want to show you how. How do you get out? Well, the first thing was, I discovered, I was, I was reading through Proverbs. If you read Proverbs over and over and over again, you get a master's degree in finance. It's amazing. There's 31 Proverbs, so you can read one a day. Just get your little spiritual one a day. And so I'm doing my little spiritual one a day one morning, and I've read through this a bazillion times, and I've heard this. People call in on my radio show. They're getting out of debt, and they say, I'm getting out of debt. They have this thing in their voice that tells me that they're going to make it. And then the others, they call in, they're like, well, dude, sort of kind of like maybe the strategy and maybe the word sort of maybe. So what sort of do you do? I'm like, well, I can't help you. Call me back. I didn't know what it was, but I said, like, call me back when you're mad or something, you know. you got to get that thing going, you know. And I couldn't put my finger on it, and I was reading through Scripture one morning, and, and I hit Proverbs 6, 1 through 7. And it says, if you've signed surety, my son, which is Old English Bible talk, forgot yourself in debt. If you've gotten yourself in debt, do this. Now, I teach people how to get out of debt, and I wanted to get out of debt, and so I saw a do this, and my little ears went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because I had a spiritual experience a few years ago. I discovered God is smarter than me. And when he says, you're here and you don't want to be here, so do this, I'm listening for what comes after that. That's a big deal. If you're in debt, biblically, do this. Give no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. And deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, a bird from the hand of the fowler. And I promise you, it's not very reverent, but I promise you I went, great, gazelle. What am I going to do with gazelle? Great little animal metaphor, talk about it in Sunday school. But, I mean, how are you going to talk to people about gazelles and death? This doesn't. That night, God answered my prayer. I was scanning the channels, and I hit the Discovery Channel. And there on the Discovery Channel... There was the gazelle. They were out there gazelling around. And what were they doing? Well, I said, well, you know, here it is. There's the gazelles. And you know the gazelles were not there by themselves, right? You know somebody else was around, right? Looking for lunch in all the right places. And gazelles, they have a cheetah detector right behind their ear. When they see a cheetah, they go like, uh oh, cheetah! Now, the Discovery Channel said that the, the cheetah is the fastest animal on dry land. We had to slow this down so I'd have time to talk. He goes from zero to 47 miles an hour in four leaps. Now, it's starting to come clear to me. Here's how you get out of debt. You deliver yourself like the gazelle from the hand of the hunter. The primary predator of the gazelle is the cheetah. Here's how you get out of debt. You run! You got to bust it! He picked out the college student, didn't he? Hey, hey, you want a free hat? Hey, I'll give you a t-shirt. Just sign up for this credit card. You want a pizza? Hey, come here, kid. You need to build up your FICO score. Come here, kid. That was how you get out of debt. You got to run, baby. You got to put it in gear. You got to go, 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 go. Kick it, baby. Kick it. You know how long we had to look for a clip where he gets away? 
The truth is that the cheetah doesn't catch the gazelle, but one in 19 times, and yet he can outrun him. Isn't that weird? What a great metaphor. Cheetah's after your family. Run! That's how you get out of debt. You pop it. Around our place, we find out that people get out of debt when they get gazelle intensity. When they quit caring what their broke friends think and their family who needs counseling thinks. They quit worrying about everybody else's opinion about what they drive. And they sell, they amputate the $40,000 Tahoe. And they're driving a hoopty. A piece of junk. They're going to drive like no one else so that later they get to drive like no one else. Because they want to change their family tree. They want to send their kids to college. They want to change how their grandkids live and their great-grandkids live. A godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. They want to change and they get fired up. When you get fired up, you'll get out of debt. You can wander into debt, honey, but you can't wander out. you got to bust it. The, the, the gravitational pull is too strong. It holds you in the orbit. You have to kick the energy to break the orbit. It's the only chance you make. And if you do, if you do it long enough, eventually you get to chase the cheetah. <laughs> Thank you, Photoshop. <laughs> Second thing we're going to teach you to do is you need to do the debt snowball. The debt snowball is where you list all of your debts, smallest to largest. You pay minimum payments on everything but the little one, and you attack the little one regardless of the interest rate. My medical bills don't have any interest on them. Shut up and pay off the smallest one. Why would it, shouldn't we pay off the highest interest rate first? Wouldn't that be mathematically correct? Darling, if we were doing math, we wouldn't have credit card debt. <laughs> this is about behavior modification. The problem with my money is the guy in my mirror. I've got to change my behaviors. We had one mom going through our courses that put great big debt snowball. The form's on the back of your handout, by the way. The great big debt snowball blew it up, put it on her refrigerator door. She'd draw a big red line through it every time she knocked one out. And the kids said she'd be walking through the kitchen looking at that thing going, you're going down. <laughs> the kids are like, mom's losing it. But you got to have a game plan. When you knock off that smallest one, you feel good. It's like going on a diet and losing weight. When you knock that next one off, you feel good. Every time you pay off one, you got more money to attack the next one down. The snowball rolls over. It gets bigger. By the time you get to the bottom, you are wiped. Because it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's amazing. I ran my, ran two marathons one day the other day. My first and my last all in one day. Um. But it's amazing. I run halves now. A whole marathon is just too tough. It's an old guy. But, but I run these halves, and it's amazing to me. I can run for two hours or hour and a half. I can run 13 miles, and I'm running along for all this time, and I can still have a little bit left to sprint at the end. Isn't that weird? Because you can see the end. When you can see the end, and the light at the end of the tunnel is not an oncoming train, you can go. You go, that's it. That's the last one. And you get this thing going, you know. And people are like, just stay away from them. They're getting out of debt. They're just, they're, they, are, they are weird people. And you become weird people because, no, by the way, normal is broke. You don't want to be normal. The Bible says be a peculiar people. I made it an art form. So there's five things you need to do with doing the debt snowball and with your gazelle intensity. Five steps out of debt. Let's look at them. The first one is you need to save money. You need to save money. We teach people the very first thing to do with money, what we call baby step one, is save $1,000. As fast as you can, get a little bit of a savings account. Because if you just get in there and you just start cutting up your credit card and you have no money and your tire is flat, then you're like, you know, you're in here going, okay, I'm, I'm getting out of debt. That's it. I'm, I'm cutting these things up. I'm done, baby. That's it. I'm done. And, and then you go out there and your tire's flat. You'll be back in here going, where's the crazy glue? Because <laughs> you've been leaning on these things. They're a rubber crutch, but you've been leaning on them. So you put a little bit of money aside as your first thing. Save some money. That's the first step. The next step is you got to quit borrowing more money. You can't get out of a hole while you dig out the bottom. So you got to say, that's it. No matter what happens, no matter what the situation, no matter how desperate or how intriguing or what the big opportunity is, I am not borrowing money anymore. And you get these things out, and you have a plastectomy party. And if you've got kids, have your kids help you cut them. Because your kids will remember that. When you're at the store, you say, you remember? We cut up, we cut up the cards, remember? I want that. I don't have any money. I cut up the cards. Remember, you helped me cut them up. But the kids will remember. You'll run into your kids 30 years later. They're 36 years old, and they'll remember that day they were 6 years old, and the family tree was changed. They'll feel it in their emotions. Things happen when families take a stand. It, things start to shift. It's a behavior modification issue. It's a matter of character. 
It's a matter of where you're going to live. I'm not borrowing money anymore. The next time I get ready to buy a car, I'm going to save a car payment for 10 months and write a check and buy cash. See, a car payment's $478. You put that in a cookie jar for 10 months, you got $5,000. Will that buy a little car? Say yes. Do I want to drive that car forever? Say no. I don't want to drive a $5,000 car forever. But I could drive it for 10 more months while I saved up another $5,000, and then I'd have a $10,000 car, right? Because the good news about that $5,000 car is it isn't going down much in value. It's pretty well done. <laughs> I'm not borrowing money any more. And then God will go, this is a test. And your transmission goes out, right? No, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And then he has the opportunity to show up. I had a friend of mine decided he wasn't borrowing money anymore. Three weeks later, his car engine blew up. He had no money. He had to have the car to get to work. He called me and said, what do you do? I said, I don't know what you do. But I'll tell you what you've got to do. You've got to, this is a decision. Right now, you're deciding how you're going to live the rest of your life. Right now. This is a hinge pin moment. The guy at his church, he was telling him what was going on. The guy at his church goes, man, I got, a, I got an old pickup back here. It's not anything fancy, but you can drive it for a few weeks. He drove that old pickup for three months, saved up, paid cash for a little car. The guy has a pile of money now. That was just a few years ago. But he made a decision in that moment and allowed one of God's people to show up. God's showing up through his people. Go figure. To help him out and walk him through this thing. Quit borrowing more money. The third one is prayer really works. Now, I'm not a theologian. I'm just kind of a regular guy that loves Jesus. And, and, but I'll tell you this. The way I got it figured out is this. You're deeply in debt. And your heavenly Father is crazy about you. God in heaven thinks you're awesome. You're deeply in debt. And, oh, good news, he owns everything. He's really rich. Your dad is rich, and you're in debt. Phone home, E.T. Check in. Call home. Now, I'm not saying God's going to give stupid people money because they will lose it. But if you're on a plan, I can tell you this. Over the years of counseling people, I've watched people year after year after year who are getting out of debt and are gazelle intense. I've watched their incomes go up as they're doing that. Blessing is a term. Kind of mystical and weird. Not really. It's kind of practical. You now became trustworthy. Worthy of trust. And the father looks and says, hmm, that one's growing a brain. (laughs) We may be able to use that one. I don't want to phone home. He's mad at me. He's not mad at you. Well, you don't know what I've done, Dave. Listen, how many of you have had enough kids that you had a stupid one? (laughs) God has some stupid kids. And don't you love the stupid one anyway? I mean, I don't care if I get an A or a C. I mean, I care, but I mean, I love the C as much as I love the A, don't I? Because I'm a loving father, and I'm an imperfect father. He loves you anyway. If you phone home with the right attitude and you hadn't called home in a while, he's not mad at you. As a matter of fact, he'll throw a party, give you a new suit of clothes, put a gold ring on your finger, and serve filet mignon. It's in there. Look it up. It'll change your life. Prayer really works. Ask for some help. Number four, sell something. Sell so much stuff the kids think they're next. Name the dog eBay. <laughs> put the kid and I mean, put the cat on Craigslist. You gotta sell stuff. If it's not bolted down, dump it. Not that Craigslist. <laughs> Has he got his own list? Oh my gosh. Most of you don't need to sell your house. Most of you, that's not it. But some of you need to sell your car. Some of you are out of control. I have people call me up. You know, Dave, I make $32,000 a year. How do I fund my kid's college? Uh, well, how much do you owe on your car? I was calling about college. <laughs> yeah, I know, but how much do you owe on your car? 28000 You make 32000 you're driving a $28,000 car. Dude, that's stupid. See, that's biblical counsel right there. <laughs> Amputate the Tahoe. You can't get traction with a $600 car payment, and nobody's impressed, really. They're not. They act like they are, and about 20 minutes after the toxic smell wears off the new car smell, they're not impressed anymore. That's it. N- number five, take a part-time job or an extra job or some overtime or something like that. 
My grandmother used to say there's a great place to go when you're broke. To work. <laughs> work is a surefire money-making scheme. If you read Scripture, our God is a God of work. The diligent prosper. Don't work, don't eat. It's all in there. I'm just praying and waiting on God. No, that's Christian for lazy. <laughs> There's a time you wait on God. I'm just kidding around. But, but a lot of times when my brothers and sisters in Christ say that, I just give them a little kick. Move. Get moving. You know, because you're just rationalizing in the name of Christ being lazy. Get off your tail end and go kill something. You've got to get up, leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home. That's how it works, man. We're a people of action. We're not a people of passivity. We're a people that's proactive and causes things to happen. Get out there and knock something down, man. Make a mess somewhere. You know, that, go, go make some money. It, it'll solve a lot of There's only two sides of the equation, the income and the outgo. You've got to get the outgo down and the income up, big margin in the middle for giving and saving. This is for formulas. So you really do have to make some more money. Do you want to work crazy for the rest of your life? No. You work like no one else, so later you can work like no one else. You know when I work? Whenever I want. You know why? Because we get to work all the time. You know, I do what I want to do when I want to do it. I'm going rotten. But there's a way you get there. You spoil yourself rotten by pouring on the coals, making a difference for a period of time. Intensity for a short period of time blows things up. Do these five steps. They will absolutely get you out of debt every time. Think about it with me. If you had no payments, if you were gazelle intense and you used the debt snowball and you prayed and you worked extra and you quit borrowing more money and you sold stuff and you got completely out of debt, breathe that in, no payments. Man, if you didn't have any payments, how much could you save? Wow. How much could you invest without a house payment? You know, you invest a house payment, how fast that's a million dollars? Do some stuff with a million dollars. How much could you give if you had no payments? I talked to a lady the other day who paid off her house, and she said, you know, I've been wanting a dining room suit for so long, and now I can buy a dining room suit every month. Isn't it weird? I had a weird experience after we got completely out of debt. I was walking through the mall, and I saw all this stuff, and I could buy anything in there, and suddenly I didn't want any of it. It was the weirdest thing. It changes your life. It releases you to be who you really are. Your father has a plan for you, and it's not to serve other masters. It's to serve the master. And it's hard to do that when you're being pulled in 50 different directions. But it's free, baby. Get gazelle intense. Run! Bust into this thing. It's, it, it's a violent process. Embrace the violence. It'll change everything, and it'll take you exactly where you need to go. Father God, I just ask that you remove our spirit of debt from these households that are represented here over the airwaves and that are represented here in this room. That Father, that you take your th these folks' eyes off of stuff and you put their eyes on the future that you have for them and you give them a vision because where there is no vision, the people perish. And we are perishing as a people. Lord, just step into this situation and pour your spirit on it and remove this need for stuff. And then allow us, Father, to have the stuff that you want us to have because a loving Father gives us good gifts. And we're thankful for the things you do give us. We enjoy nice things from you. But we need to know they're from you and not from FICO. So, Father, show these folks how to do this stuff. Inject a spirit of gazelle intensity into everyone watching this right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If I get the band to come forward, please. Wow, what would you all think? Good stuff, huh? Good stuff. I took notes myself. I, you know, wrote some things, and maybe, you, how many of y'all took notes? Anybody take notes with me? Oh, yeah, lots of you. Um, you know, it's important for us to save some money, to quit borrowing money, to remember that prayer really works, to sell some things if we need to, and to take a part-time job sometimes if we've gotten off the track so much. We want you to know that we care so much about your finances that um, we really wanted to do this series because not a week goes by when we don't get a phone call from someone who's having problems with their job, someone who can't pay their light bill, somebody who's they've had a family member be sick. And so the best thing we can do to help you be, all God wants you to be, is help you with your finances. I want you to know that at our church we have many families who have taken financial peace when we've offered it here. And those families have availed themselves to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one if you need help. 
Some people are embarrassed to take a class. Sometimes you work a second job to where you can't take a class. We want you to know that we are here to help you. If you need some financial counseling, all you have to do is ask. Now, that requires us to be a little humble sometimes and to be real and to ask for that guidance. But we want you to know that it matters to us, and we want to help you so that you don't have to be in bondage. Does anyone want to be in bondage? We serve a God who tells us it's for freedom he set us free. And I can guarantee you this. If we were to take a tally sheet and tally, it would astound us how many of us this afternoon are going to be hit with the gimmies. If we go to the grocery store, we're going to want to buy something, aren't we? They're going to entice us to it. We watch, anybody watching TV today? If you watch the TV, how many commercials are going to be on telling you you have to have this to be a full person? And even things that are ingrained in us when we pull up at a traffic light beside somebody and we check out their car and think, nice car, I wouldn't mind having all those. We want to guard you against that. We want to teach you to be abnormal. When it comes to our finances, let's be an abnormal people. On the back of your connection card, there are always next steps. And these are steps that you can take to grow in your faith, and we challenge you. And maybe for you, the first one is the most important one. We never want to end a service without offering this. Maybe for a while you've been considering this whole God thing. And maybe God has been kind of drawing you to him, and you're sitting here this morning, you've been thinking about it, and you know, you're, you're trying to do things your own way, and yet you feel this pull of God. And maybe today's the day that you say, I want to put my trust in Christ. I want you to know that if you do that, that we will call you, we will rejoice with you, we will walk with you and help you to do the things that you need to do so that you can grow in your faith. And for those of you who put your trust in Christ a long time ago, I want you to remember this. Every time you walk into church, I want you to remember this. Today could be the day for somebody else. It matters that you're sitting here. It matters to that person that today is their day. I want you to think about the day that was your day. We've all had those days. We need to be there for others so they can experience their day. So important. And then maybe you've been thinking about being baptized. You'd like to be baptized. We'd be more than glad to help you with that. But I want you to pay attention to the third one. I will ask God what he would have me to do with my finances in 2014. You know, a lot of times we use God as a cosmic vending machine, don't we? Anything we want, we think we can press this button and press that. God, help me out. God, be my lifeline. But we don't ask for God's direction before we go and make decisions. So I would ask that this year you would make that your prayer, that you would go to God and you would say to God, maybe for the first time in your life, God, what would you have me to do with my finances? And listen to what his answer is. And then we ask you, and I thank you for so many of you that took this next step to heart and you brought a friend with you or you invited someone because I've met several of them this morning. I will intentionally invite someone to attend next week's Dave Ramsey message. We've all got friends. We've all got friend, uh, neighbors. We've all got family members who we know here need to hear what Dave is teaching. So I thank you. If you would invite them and ask you to take that as your next step. If you stand, we're going to sing our closing song. But as we do, I want to pray for us this morning because this issue is so important and so many of us are in bondage. We need to ask God to be in the middle of this. Please pray with me. God, we love you. And God, we admit that we are not where we need to be when it comes to our finances. We have all stumbled. We have all made mistakes. But you are a God who makes all things new. And I ask that in 2014, that you would help us to have reckless abandon, that you would teach us to run, to run with everything we have to turn our focus to you and not worry about what the world says about money. God, we don't want to be in bondage. You're a God who sets us free. Let us be free so we are free to glorify you, so we are free to give to others, so we can teach our children not to be under the weight of bondage. God, I know that every parent in here no parent in here wants their child to grow up and be in debt. And God is our Heavenly Father. I know you don't want that for us either. Give us the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the wisdom. God, surround us with people who will help us to break free. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. As our ushers